All right, on to the next section, breaking down Google's network. Now, in this video, we're gonna take a high level look at the GCP network infrastructure, and then we're also gonna look into regions and zones and multi-regional resources within GCP. But the first thing I'd like to do is give you a broader view on how GCP's network is set up. And we're gonna do that by going directly to Google Cloud's webpage. Once you get to their webpage here, you're gonna see all the cloud locations. It's really cool. It's a nice visualization because what I really like about it is that you're seeing the regions, the zones, network edge locations, countries, territories, all this good stuff. But what stands out to me the most is when you scroll down to this map, and this map is continuously being updated. Honestly, when I just looked at it again today, I just saw that there's two more regions coming here in the US with Dallas, and you have another one coming into Columbus, Ohio. You also can see ones all over the world coming to Paris, Madrid, all kinds of places. And what's nice about this is that if you want the most up-to-date information, you're gonna to wanna to come to this webpage. Also, keep in mind, you see down here on the lower left-hand corner, each region with a blue dot has three zones. And what those three zones indicate, those are actual data centers in that region. And the white dots are the future zones that we were just talking about, ones that are coming in the future. But one standout out of all these is the one in Iowa, and that's US Central One. That has actually four zones, so four data centers there. So those are your regions. And then when you click on network, this shows you all the traffic, essentially, as far as how the cables are laid out, the submarine cables, you know, also the investments for future ones as well. So you're just seeing a lot of information here. If you're into networking and things like that, this is really cool to look at. And it's also, if you really want to dig deeper, there's several other articles and other topics you can learn a lot more about networking. But this just gives you a nice visualization of it overall. So taking a, a quick step back, in this section, we're looking at section 2.4 of the exam guide. So regions, zones, regional resources, zonal resources, and multi-regional resources. And that's going to be the next section we're going to jump into coming up next. Understanding zonal, regional, multi-regional, and global resources within GCP. So the first thing, let's talk about zonal resources, right? Because these are very common and you'll come across this frequently when you're using Google Cloud, especially if you're using Compute Engine virtual machines, because those are zonal resources, meaning that they exist in that particular zone that you create them in, and that's what is required when you set them up. And the same thing can be said about the persistent disk, which are the actual hard drives where you store information. When you create these Compute Engine virtual machines, those stay within that zone as well. But when you look at regional and global resources, some examples of this are static external IP addresses. So basically, those could be regional. I could create an IP address for an application that I've created, and that could be accessed directly to that particular region where that IP address was created. And then when you look at the VPC network as a whole, which we'll look at here in a moment, that network setup is a global resource, meaning it could be accessed all over the world. So I could set up a network and you'll be able to reach that no matter where you are in the entire world. So those are the differences between the zonal and regional and the global resources. But it's no fun unless we look a little bit deeper at a brief demo in the Google Cloud Console. Okay, so we're in a Google Cloud project. And now what I want to do, let's just search for VPC networks at the top. It's much faster to do it that way. And when we click on that, what you're going to see is the whole network that I was just showing you on the website all set up automatically when this project was created. And the reason why I want to show you this, you can see US Central 1, Europe West 1, you can see all these regions and zones all set up with networks and IP addresses all the way down here to the bottom. And what's great about this is that that was done as soon as I created this VPC network within GCP. Well, you might also be asking, okay, so what does that mean for my zonal resources and regional resources? Well, we'll jump there in a second, but this is where that global resource comes into play. This VPC network is a global resource. And as you can see here, it can connect to all these different data centers, regions, zones, all that good stuff all across the world. Now, the next thing we want to do is we're going to go into Compute Engine. And the reason we're going to go into Compute Engine is because I want you to be able to see how you can choose your, your regions and zones when you're setting up a VM instance. So once we come in here, we're just going to go ahead. I'm going to click on Create Instance. And as soon as I click on Create, you're going to see the region. I can choose Iowa. I can choose Toronto, Northern Virginia. And you can see now these are the data centers I can choose from. So those are classified as the zones we talked about earlier. And then from there, if I scroll down, you also can change uh, and set up your boot disk, which is where the, you know, the disk will be located as well. Because once I create this, this same disk will be located in this same zone and region that we're creating it. And then once that's all set up, 
you're going to see the price and cost and so forth here on the right hand side. These are just estimates. But that's how this is what a zonal resource looks like within GCP. Now let's look at a regional resource. So we're going to go to VPC network and then we're going to go over to external IP addresses. So external IP address is where you could preserve it. Let's say you have application, what may have you, and you need to use this so that your customer can have access to your application. I'll just put in the test name here. And as you can see, as I scroll down, the type, it could be a regional or global. So if I choose regional, it's going to be placed in the region I specify. As you can see here, there's no zones. You don't see the C, the A, B, C, D. You don't see any of that here. But if I click on global, you're going to just see it global just gets rid of all that and it's going to be a global resource you know, from the beginning. So those are the differences between a regional global uh, resource within GCP. And then the last one I'd like to show you, let's look at a, a multi-regional resource. And this is pretty cool because this is something that can actually be in several regions at once. So I'm going to go to cloud storage and I'm going to go ahead and create a bucket. And before I even name it, I'm just going to click on choose where to store your data. And this is where you're going to see the different options. So you're going to have multi-region. So this is multiple regions in the U.S., at least three. The same thing with Europe, same thing with Asia Pacific. And then there's also a dual region where you can choose two different regions. And you can see the different options with that. Europe, you have Netherlands and Finland, Iowa and South Carolina for the U.S., Tokyo and Osaka for Asia Pacific. And then the region, you can choose a region as well. So this is a service that lets you do regional, dual region, and multi-region. So it really just depends on the type of service you're going to be using in GCP. And that ultimately determines where you can have this resource reside. And it gives you a lot of flexibility and just a lot more it helps you with strategy when you're planning out how to build an application or you're trying to help a client decide where they should set their resources up. So with all that being said, let's go ahead back to the, the main page. And when we look at the same page where we saw the network, if you scroll down a little bit, I love this page because check this out. You're gonna see each product and where it's available. So when I'm looking in America, if I scroll down here, I'm gonna scroll down a little bit more so you can see that if I scroll down in West One, Oregon, I can't use the Google Cloud VMware engine because it's not available in that region, but it is available in West Two. And you can see similar things as you go across. I drag it across, West Three, it's not there, West Four, but it's in Central One. So the, the cool thing about this is depending on which service you're using, you definitely want to check where it's available. You know, So if you have a lot of customers in a particular region, you can actually set it up and improve the performance of that application based on where they're located. So that's something to keep in mind. Also, if I scroll down a little bit further, you're going to see the global products. Now, the cool thing with these global products, as we were just talking about earlier, a little bit about some of the networking and things like that, cloud load balancers, the interconnect, things that are outside the scope of this course, but all of these things have no dependence on location at all. So these things down here, cloud shell, you know, the logging, things of that nature, you can use these no matter where they're located. So that's something to keep in mind uh, when you're thinking about setting up GCP resources. And then also, if I click on multi-region, this tab here, this is going to show you all the products that are available in multiple regions. So if we're looking at the container registry, if you're looking at cloud healthcare APIs in the US only, things like that, you can see where all these things reside. Cloud Spanner is a big one. You can see where it has all these multiple different regions. You can set it up. Cloud Storage, I showed you. BigQuery. So these are those items and these products and services that give you that multi-region flexibility. And it's really helpful because, like I said earlier, you could really cover a wide audience and a wide customer base when they're using GCP. Google Cloud Support Options. Now, this is an exciting section just simply for the fact that if you need help with GCP, we've got you covered. And how do we have you covered? Well, let's look directly at Google Cloud's website and look at all the different support options that are available to you. So if you go to cloud.google.com slash support, what you're going to find is a customer care portfolio. Now, Google has revamped this over the years, and I want to point out to it, if you scroll down in the middle, it's going to break down all your customer care offerings. And these are your support options within GCP. And for the exam, you definitely need to understand which one you'd want to use, depending on the situation you're in or just the type of service you need for that application or whatever you're trying to build on GCP. Now, the first one, the basic support is, is free. Everyone gets it. Basically, you can put in case, phone, and chat support for billing issues. So you can open up those support cases for that. But when you start paying for it, the $29 plus 3% net spend, that's when you can get standard support. So this is covers some more items here. You don't necessarily need to know every single thing, but the key things here, you do get case support for technical issues. 
and then P2 cases, you have a four hour initial response time. So basically you're just you're paying to get things resolved quicker. And then the enhanced support, and they're even doing a promotion here at the time of this recording uh, for 50% off, but ultimately this one is a 50% discount. It's usually $500 a month for that one. And that just gives you more cloud support API, things of that nature. And then the last one is the premium support. Now, if you're an enterprise, you're probably gonna have this, if you don't, especially if you don't have your own staff or depending on how huge your staff is that works on GCP, you could use this for some of your critical workloads. So I like the breakdown with this. It's much simpler than it was in the past because you do have you know, the basic all the way up to premium. And that pretty much covers all of the support options within GCP. The cool thing also I want to point, point out, if you click on calculate estimated cost, you can also see how much support would cost just depending on how much you spend on GCP. So if I came in here and put in, I'm spending, let's say $10,000, you could see the total estimated cost would be $329 for that one month. So it really just depends on how much you spend uh, on how much you'll, you'll pay as well. So if I deleted that and let's say I only spent hundred bucks, so it would cost $32. So that gives you an idea on what it would cost to use GCP support. Hope this makes sense. I'll see you in the next video. All right, welcome to the next section. And let's talk about SLAs. But first, let's, of course, we gotta ask you the question, what does SLA mean in regards to Google Cloud? And SLA is a service level agreement for those of you familiar with it and working in other industries. But when we're talking about Google Cloud in particularly, it's ultimately just an agreement based on a monthly uptime percentage on a covered Google Cloud service. And we're gonna look deeper into that right now directly on the Google Cloud webpage so you can see examples of what this looks like for a service that you may be interested in using. So we're gonna search for Google Cloud service level agreements. And right on this page, you're gonna see all the different services within Google that have service level agreements. Keep in mind, there's gonna be things that are generally available to you. So if it's a beta product, it doesn't have any type of SLA on it. But let's just for an example, let's pick a popular one and we'll scroll down. Let's look at cloud storage. Now, what I like about this is it pretty much breaks down exactly what you're getting as far as a monthly uptime percentage. And this is what Google is basically saying that if your data is in a storage class at multi-region or dual region, you're gonna get 99.95% is the monthly uptime percentage. Now, if it goes below that, what happens is, is that Google can provide you with financial credits as described below. And there's a lot of details on this on this website, but the bottom line is to keep in mind, you do have to request this. It's just not automatic. But what's good about it is, is that if you're using a service, you can be, and it's on this SLA list, you can be assured that you know, you're gonna have some type of guarantee that it's gonna be working as you would expect it to. And if it does not, you can get this financial credit based on the outage that may have happened. Also, there's, you can look for Google Cloud Dashboard. And if you look at that, you can see the status of all the different services from a Google perspective. And this can kind of help you understand too, how long something has been up or down. If there's any type of outage, then it would show up here. And that also can kind of keep you up to speed on what's been down or if there's having an issue with some type of service. And there's also the ability to see that in the Google Cloud dashboard as well. So if you're on the Google Cloud homepage, sometimes you can see things that show right here in this right hand corner where it says Google Cloud Platform status. So it says all services are normal, so you're all set. So that pretty much wraps up what an SLA is, how to find it. And just keep in mind, if you need any more info, just go back to the Google Cloud SLA terms page and you can check out the SLAs for all the different services here. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video. We've reached the end of this course. I really hope you enjoyed it. Taking a step back to the beginning and looking at this Google Cloud Digital Leader and looking at the exam guide and what you need to know, you're seeing we covered today general Google Cloud knowledge, which covers about 25 to 35% of the exam. For next steps, I definitely recommend reviewing some sample questions. I've included some of you on this course. There's also some on Google Cloud Space that you can take a look at. There's also a learning hub and certification hub that you can look at, get you some more information. And as you can see here, you can go ahead and register for it, $99. But as we take a scroll down on this page, going back to the exam guide, if you haven't gone through section three yet, I'd highly recommend you get up to speed on Google Cloud products and services. And this is gonna go deeper into more of the topics that I touched on during this general course. So hopefully you got a lot out of this. Hopefully I'll see you online on LinkedIn. Thanks for watching, take care.
Are you ready?